Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Douglas Guilfoyle, and I am Professor of International Law and Security at the University of New South Wales, Canberra. I'd like to begin by expressing my gratitude to the NUS Centre for International Law and uh, uh, CIL Dialogues for hosting this online event. Our topic this afternoon, or this evening, or potentially this morning, depending on where you are, is small states, international legal argument, and international disputes. Our panelists this evening first explored this topic at a workshop at UNSW Canberra last November, conducted as part of an Australian Research Council project. Short versions of those papers have also appeared as a blog symposium hosted by CIL Dialogues, and it's to those short papers we'll be speaking this evening. Now, I'll say a little more about the project as a whole after very briefly introducing our panel and commentators. Uh, so there'll be no long academic bias this evening, in part because time is pressing, and in part because my voice, as you may hear, is failing. Um, so our panel this evening consists of myself, uh, Juliet McIntyre, lecturer at the University of South Australia, who will be presenting her paper, Great Hall, Small States. Frances Angardi, a senior lecturer at the University of Wollongong, who will be talking to her paper, A Collective Answer, Small States, Sea Level Rise, and the interpretation of UNCLOS, and Associate Professor Beck Strating, Director of the La Trobe Asia Institute at La Trobe University, uh, who talked to her paper, Small States and Normative Sea Power. Our commentators this evening are Professor uh, Dr. Nilofer Oral of um, the NUS Centre for International Law and Martins Paparinskas, Professor Martins Paparinskas of University College London. Um, now, while I've said I'm not going to be providing academic bias, I do feel constrained to note that we are very lucky to have them as our commentators today, as they're both presently serving as members of the International Law Commission, and Nilifer was chair of the 2023 session. Now, before we turn to the other panellists, um, let me say a little about how this project came about. Uh, for those of us interested in international law, there are a number of contradictory claims that we're all familiar with. One is that an international order, sometimes called a rules-based order or a liberal international order, but one underpinned by international law provides some form of level playing field for small states and medium powers. A counter narrative is that international law is fundamentally unenforceable and great powers will always do what they will regardless of the law. Now, my particular area of interest is the use by small states of law of the sea litigation against larger powers including permanent members of the Security Council, and especially the UK, China, and Russia. So in this context, the question for me uh, became, and this was sort of the beginning of the project, not why would great powers comply with a court or arbitral ruling, but rather why would small states litigate if they can't win? And after all, if we look particularly at the law of the sea environment, uh, such litigation by small states is not rare anymore. We can think of a number of case studies. Um, recently, uh, a lot of us have been concerned with um, Russian claims against the UK regarding the Chagos Archipelago and a series of cases there. The Philippines uh, initiated South China Sea arbitration. Um, Timor-Leste's invocation of compulsory maritime boundary conciliation with Australia under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And a series of cases launched before ITLOS um, against Russia, including two Ukrainian cases that predate the present conflict, and the Netherlands case concerning the Greenpeace um, vessel Arctic Sunrise in 2013. Now, in all of these cases, states choose to litigate across a significant asymmetry of power and without any realistic expectation of immediate compliance with an arbitral award or the decision of a court or tribunal. Why? We might expect to find an answer perhaps in the literature on strategic litigation and lawfare. Um, but for me, that literature is not especially helpful. It does make a number of useful and interesting points, including the idea that a campaign for social, political and legal change can be pursued through a series of related legal proceedings. But fundamentally, these theories, or sometimes simple descriptors, 
can't draw a line between where the ordinary business of doing international law ends, say the work of a government legal advisor, and where these supposedly exceptional practices of lawfare and strategic litigation begin. So I've come to be an advocate of the term legal statecraft. If we turn to our colleagues in international relations, as we occasionally do, uh, it's generally accepted that states will use the instruments of power available to them to pursue strategic ends, and that this is commonly called statecraft. Now, statecraft has a number of potential instruments, uh, military statecraft, diplomatic statecraft, economic statecraft, even cultural diplomacy and soft power statecraft. But what the literature very largely lacked, it seemed to me, was any discussion of legal statecraft. That is how states actively and ordinarily use the law and seek to shape the law to better achieve their interests. So, how does legal argument work as statecraft? Well, we'll have a number of views on this um, put uh, today, but very briefly, I suggested in my blog post for this symposium and in the, my longer paper in the British Yearbook of International Law upon which it is based, that legal argument as a strategy or as a tool of statecraft has two key advantages for small states. First, international law is, I would hope, uh, generally accepted as a record of agreed community norms and a yardstick for legitimate behavior among the community of states. It's not the exclusive yardstick of legitimacy, but it's nonetheless a very important one. Therefore, by framing a dispute as legal, a small state has an advantage, a sort of first mover advantage in contesting the legitimacy of a larger state's policy, and also potentially the legitimacy of the actor behind that policy, the respondent state as well. Second, as Koskinyemi has long pointed out, international law allows small states to frame their grievances as not just a wrong done to them individually, but potentially as a wrong done to a collective interest. So particularly in law of the sea matters, a small state might say this affects not only us, but all members of the convention. So that is a legal claim may allow a state to multilateralize a dispute and attempt to mobilize a supportive constituency. So in sum, legal argument is useful for a small state because it may be a means of multilateralizing the dispute, mobilizing support, and inflicting a cost, even if only a legitimacy cost, upon the respondent. Conversely, respondent states will typically attempt to frame the dispute as either non-legal or non-justiciable to avoid that legitimacy penalty. And they will also attempt to frame the dispute as being strictly bilateral in order to avoid the multilateralization of the dispute. So the case, uh, the, the claim usually put by respondent states in, uh, in my argument in law of the sea litigation is that the case is politically motivated and falls outside the relevant dispute resolution mechanism. So the classic response to small states then is that this dispute is politically confected. It does not truly fall within the convention. It concerns bilateral issues, usually questions of sovereignty of long standing. Now, very intriguingly, that type of response isn't confined to a particular type of respondent. The argument is made as equally by the UK as by China in relevant law of the sea proceedings and often in strikingly similar language. All right, so if that's the dynamic that plays out in litigation or legal argument, does it achieve anything for small states? We might think looking at the South China Sea dispute that the successes for the Philippines have at best been modest and perhaps international law has done more to freeze or stabilize than resolve the conflict. On the other hand, the United Kingdom at the end of a series of three defeats before an unclosed arbitral tribunal, an advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice and the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea has publicly said that it is recommencing negotiations with Mauritius for the return of the Chagos Archipelago. Now, my claim is not that such litigation always works. My claim is that in seeking to influence politics, it is a legitimate tool of statecraft and that it does, in fact, influence politics. Uh, however, mine is not the only view on how small states may use international legal argument in the course of their disputes, and it is not necessarily the most interesting we will hear this evening uh, or this morning or this afternoon. Um, without further ado, I'll pass you over to our panelists and then our commentators, and with luck, there'll be time for brief Q&A at the end. And if you do have questions as we go, 
please drop them into the Q&A function on Zoom. Uh, so now, Juliet, can I invite you to address us on your blog post, Great Hall, Small States? That's better, not muted. Um, thank you so much, Doug, uh, and greetings from Adelaide, situated on the traditional lands of the Ghana people. Um, so as you've just heard, the title of my piece um, that CIO Dialogues was kind enough to host was Great Hall, Small States. And my argument is that the enforcement of a judgment isn't actually all that important to small states engaged in litigation against powerful states, particularly at the International Court of Justice. My argument is that it's in fact small state participation in the proceedings that gives important expression to sovereign equality. So in order to make this argument out, I try to establish three things, each of which builds on one another. So first of all, procedures can be used expressively. And then secondly, the ICJ's oral proceedings expressively manifest procedural fairness, which encompasses three particular values, party equality, state dignity, and court impartiality. And then thirdly, party equality at the ICJ flows from sovereign equality of states. And this then leads into the conclusion that merely by appearing in the oral proceedings, the small state can achieve an important strategic outcome. It can palpably, expressively level the playing field. So let's look at step one, procedural expressivism. What is this? So court procedures utilise performance and symbolism in order to enact justice, that is to make it seen. And this involves two things, both the performance, that is the showing of justice, but also performativity, that is the doing of justice. So in respect of performance, oral proceedings rely on a lot of the same key elements as a theatrical performance, actors, stages, scripts, audiences, and so on. And Bentham, for this reason, called the courtroom a theatre of justice. And the performance undertaken by the parties serves to generate important symbolic capital for use both domestically and internationally. And we saw a really interesting example of this last year in the Guyana Venezuela case where Venezuela's agent wore a little pin uh, in the geographical shape of Venezuela that included the Essequibo, which is the region in dispute between the parties. So a little sort of you know, symbolic gesture there. But the formal ritual-like characteristics of oral proceedings, the black robes symbolising judicial authority and all of those other elements, are also constitutive of the court. And for the ICJ, this symbolism and ritual have particular resonance for two reasons. The first is to do with the fact that the parties before the court are sovereign states. And states communicate through diplomacy a field deeply rooted in ceremonies and rituals. When states engage with one another, they do so through protocols, etiquette, ceremonies, and the court's oral proceedings are a continuation of this symbol-driven form of interaction. But the second reason that the symbolism of equality and fairness in oral proceedings is essential is that the court lacks any enforcement mechanism. And the legitimacy of international adjudication actually relies on tradition, solemnity, power of place and ritual in order to contribute to the acceptability of the outcome. Empirical studies in domestic contexts have shown that the use of formalism and judicial symbols strengthen the links between institutional legitimacy and acceptance of the decision. And this is so even when the decision is disappointing. So that's step one. Step two is the way that oral proceedings manifest party equality. So oral proceedings express equality by physically and symbolically placing the parties in a position of adversarial equality despite any power differences that may exist outside of the courtroom. Parties are placed literally on an equal footing. They are allocated equal speaking time, Although there is an exception to this coming up in the Ukraine-Russia case, and I'm happy to come back to that in questions if people are interested in why that is. The court actively listens to both parties in an open and transparent manner. The parties have to convey their dispute using the same language of legal argumentation. No matter how powerful a party is outside of the courtroom, inside they are forced to operate as the equal of their adversary. And orality also gives litigants a more direct experience of being able to shape their own legal narratives and gives them the opportunity to have their stories heard and respected in court. 
The ritual and formality of the oral proceedings assure participants that they are being taken very seriously. And then step three, as I mentioned, relates to sovereign equality. Now, even though the oral proceedings or proceedings before the court in general are regularly criticized as merely an abbreviated or formal manifestation of sovereign equality, procedural equality between small states and big states is for the court an absolutely essential value. And sovereignty provides the justification for the adoption of procedural fairness. Before the court, states will be treated equally. Informal disputing magnifies rather than diminishes political power differences. In contrast, the highly ritualized formal space of the court's oral proceedings gives a material presence to sovereign equality and permits states to temporarily, at least, escape power relationships. But having said all that, it does have to be asked whether the performance of certain types of procedures, that is rights in the sense of R-I-T-E-S's, signal the existence of party equality and procedural fairness that is rights in the sense of R-I-G-H-T-S's, when they're actually absent. Rituals don't, they can't, guarantee substantive justice. And there are a number of challenges facing smaller or developing countries in international litigation before the ICJ. For example, the exclusive use of only French and English, the limited availability of experienced counsel, who are almost always Western, and of course costs. And these factors may indicate that the equality value in the oral proceedings is merely performed rather than being performative. But in my view, assuming that states overcome these barriers and get there, get before the court, the live presentation of argument during oral proceedings, although it is in part the means to the end production of a judgment, it's also an end in and of itself. Small states do gain something by standing in the courtroom and being treated as the equal of their adversary. Might only be a small something, but better than nothing. That's basically the summation of my blog post <laughs> in seven minutes. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you for your excellent um, timekeeping, Juliet. That's uh, a standard others can aspire to. Uh, so uh, can I pass now to um, Francis, so not every form of legal argument we're talking about this evening necessarily uh, involves a courtroom, and Francis will be talking to us about the question of small states, sea level rise, and the interpretation, providing a collective answer to the interpretation of UNCLOS. Thank you so much, Doug, and thank you so much to um, CIL for hosting this today and also the blog symposium. I'm speaking to you all today from Ngunnawal country in Canberra, Australia. So hello to everyone wherever you are and in your respective time zones. Uh, as Doug has mentioned, um, I'll be speaking um, for, to provide a little bit of a counterpoint to some of the other presentations today um, in that I'll be telling a story about how um, a, a not insignificant group of small states have deployed certain legal arguments set against the backdrop of uncertain or disputed interpretations of what the existing law of the sea provides for to work towards a particular objective, and that is the goal of preserving maritime zones notwithstanding the effects of sea level rise on their coastal territory. Now, interestingly, we'll see that there are some commonalities that have been deployed here with the strategies of legal argument used by small states in formal dispute settlement um, proceedings. And I'll also offer some thoughts about how these arguments uh, seem to be received at the moment, suggesting that perhaps there are indications that these strategies which have been employed, um, strategies of legal argument used by small states, seem to be gaining some traction in these areas beyond the formal litigation setting in the realm of treaty interpretation. So to begin with, how does this legal question arise? Now, many in here will already be familiar with the details of this legal debate, so I'll be very brief here. Um, the reason why this is an issue um, in the law of the sea is that within this body of law, there is a strong nexus which is um, established between the land and the sea in the rules of the international law of the sea, as reflected in the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS. So the question then arises as to the respective fates of the land, which might be affected by climate change impacts such as sea level rise, and to the maritime entitlements supported by that land. 
are their fates necessarily intertwined and how? So what is the answer to this question? Climate change was not contemplated at the time that UNCLOS was negotiated. The convention itself is unsurprisingly silent on the issue. Many scholars have taken the view in the, decade, in the last two decades that the likely legal consequence in these scenarios is that maritime zones could shrink or even disappear if coastlines recede. This is commonly described as an ambulatory theory of baselines or maritime zones. So against the backdrop of this concern um, expressed among scholars about the possible shrinking or loss of maritime zones, it's important to then notice that in 2021, we have two landmark uh, political declarations made by two overlapping groups of predominantly small states. These declarations make clear the views of those members on the preservation of their maritime zones, notwithstanding sea level rise. The first of these is the Pacific Islands Forum um, PIF declaration made in August 2021 on the preservation of maritime zones in the face of climate change related sea level rise. The second declaration is that made by the Alliance of Small Island States, AOSIS, whose leaders issued a similar declaration the following month. Combined, what we're talking about here is 39 UN member states, all of whom are also party to UNCLOS. Notably, excluding only Australia and New Zealand, PIF members, the remainder of these member states are also SID small island developing states. However, at first blush, these, these declarations and the position which they advocate for an interpretation of UNCLOS to preserve maritime zones seems at odds with the widely held ambulatory view uh, which is present in much, much of the preceding scholarship. So what kind of legal justification is put forward to support this position? So tonight I'd like to draw your attention to two key features of these declarations, which illustrate the kind of legal argument being put forward by these states. Firstly, we should pay attention to the fact that the PIF and AOSIS declarations make an interpretive claim. It is a political claim which can, can, contains within it an express claim about legal interpretation of the existing rules of UNCLOS. This is expressly within the language of both declarations in terms of invoking the interpretation and application of UNCLOS. And as a result, this has the effect of then bringing to bear the analytical framework of treaty interpretation within the, which is reflected in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. And in particular, I think it calls attention to Article 31.3b, which many of you will know, um, which refers to in the effect of subsequent practice in treaty interpretation, which can have legal significance when um, it reflects the agreement of the parties. Now, the success of the interpretive claim made in these declarations therefore rests in the satisfaction of the elements of this kind of treaty interpretation. Firstly, is there the relevant subsequent practice that to actually show that UNCLOS has been interpreted in this way? And we can look at implementing legislation, how have states implemented their baselines, what are the methods they've used, are those baselines updated or are they in fact retained once they've been established? The other element is agreement. Is there a common understanding amongst parties to the to UNCLOS as to what UNCLOS actually means? And here we can look to the statements which states have actually made, especially recently before the UN General Assembly in particular, and also in the context of the International Law Commission's process, uh, what is the common understanding which we can see amongst states? And indeed, looking at all that evidence will be um, necessary to judge the success of the interpretive claim. Now, the next thing to notice is that uh, making a claim about the interpretation of UNCLOS has a universal character. So we notice that it is a claim which is made by a group of particular states, the signatories to the PIF and AOSIS declaration, but it is a claim which purports to have implications for the interpretation of the convention, which currently has 169 signatories. 
So it is a much bigger claim which, with potential legal implications for a much broader set of states than just those making the declaration. So these two features, invoking a legal interpretive framework, universal in nature, um, and, with, and, and which recalls the Vienna Convention framework for interpretation, recall the key elements of legal statecraft that we've heard from Douglas today, elements of uh, legalization, universalization, um, and express framing as a legal issue. So to wrap up, if I could hazard a few comments as to how things seem to be looking at the moment in terms of the possible success or not of this um, legal argument. Now, there are different opinions about the state of play at the moment. The International Law Association's Sea Level Rise Committee in 2022 had said that the elements of the Vienna Convention um, for legally significant subsequent practice had not yet been made out at that stage. However, the International Law Commission process, of which our commentators tonight are participating and leading in, is considering this matter actively as we speak. And so we await their report, which will be coming out um, in a few months' time. And of course, that will be um, part of a longer process culminating in 2025. So that consideration is on foot. On my own analysis, I can see that there are states which are beyond um, the Pifaneosis members, which have begun to come forward to express their support for the position in those declarations. These include Germany, France and Japan, and also non-members of the convention, such as the US. Um, and that's also interesting because the US itself domestically has ambulatory baselines, for example, yet has come forward to support the position of those with a different system. So to wrap up, and I notice the time, um, um, my sense is that there are strong signs that we're witnessing a strong push by small states towards this interpretation of UNCLOS. These small states are engaged in collective action at a scale large enough to make an impact. It's difficult to ignore almost a quarter of UNCLOS parties singing the same tune. This is collective action that also harnesses universal tools of international law, such as treaty interpretation, to build a legal argument on the basis of the legal significance of a convergence of words and practice. And so to the question of whether UNCLOS permits the preservation of maritime zones, notwithstanding sea level rise, small states have offered a collective answer. And with the increasing acceptance of the international community, it seems there's an increasingly solid foundation for the success of their collective legal argument. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, um, Francis. And we're still keeping reasonably well to time, which is excellent. So we've explored the interaction of uh, legal norms and politics. Um, so now let's uh, take that one step further and hear from someone uh, whose scholarship goes to the coalface of uh, the relationship between international law and politics in the maritime domain. We'll hear from Beck on small states and normative sea power. Thank you so much. As an international relations scholar, I'm really honoured to be here on this panel with such eminent international law experts. And I'm zooming in uh, today or tonight um, from NAM, which is also known as Melbourne, uh, from the, and I'm coming in from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. So I think uh, my contribution contextualises uh, the use of international legal statecraft, as Douglas mentioned in his introduction within a broader range of statecraft options that are available uh, for smaller powers. So my piece really talks about how it's not just the, the, the use of legal statecraft that matters for outcomes, uh, but actually how small states use legal statecraft in combination with other persuasive tools and techniques, such as public diplomacy, the use of strategic narratives, and as just discussed by Francis, the use of collective regional diplomacy. Uh, but in contrast to, to Francis's work, my research focuses on bilateral maritime dispute resolution in asymmetrical power contexts where you have smaller 
states trying to change uh, the foreign policy of bigger states. Uh, so that's really my question, if you like. How does this happen? How are smaller states able to convince or to compel uh, bigger powers uh, to change their perception of their interests or uh, to change the way that they approach particular maritime problems? So for this particular project, I focused on one level of analysis, really what we call foreign policy analysis, uh, in looking at how smaller states use a combination of statecraft uh, strategies that can allow uh, them to exert what I've termed normative sea power. So unlike uh, bigger, bigger powers, small states often cannot rely on traditional forms of sea power to defend uh, and assert their maritime interests. We often think of sea power uh, in, in the sort of maritime security, naval security literature uh, through a lens of material power through you know, um, naval and military capabilities, through naval strategy. Uh, but in these sorts of asymmetrical disputes, smaller powers have to draw upon other elements of sea power to defend and assert their interests. Uh, and in asymmetrical contexts, and, and Douglas also mentioned this uh, at the top, more powerful states can often prefer to use bilateral negotiation rather than legal mechanisms such as court arbitration and conciliation, because uh, this allows them to assert more control over processes. They're more likely to maintain or leverage their power advantage in bilateral negotiations. Uh, so some of the examples that, that I've looked at are where where smaller states have compelled bigger powers to submit to an independent judicial or legal process. Uh, in example, in, in cases where the bigger power otherwise wouldn't choose that option in, in order to resolve the dispute. So there are two cases that my blog post look at, uh, the Timor Sea case between Australia and Timor-Leste and the Chagos case between the United Kingdom and Mauritius. And in both cases, Australia and the United, United Kingdom disputed uh, jurisdiction of the, the relevant tribunal conciliation, uh, but were ultimately uh, compelled to, to participate and, and to participate in good faith. Uh, so also in both cases, uh, long-standing foreign policy has consequently undergone a shift. So uh, Australia had long sought to maintain a moratorium on boundary delimitation in the Timor Sea, and this was a position it was forced to, uh, or it, it came to relinquish through uh, the use of a, a United Nations compulsory conciliation, uh, whereas in the United Kingdom case, it's uh, opened negotiations on sovereignty with Mauritius over the sovereign uh, the, the issue uh, of Chagos Archipelago, uh, which is a major reversal of policy as the UK had pre previously held firm on its assertion of sovereignty. Uh, so in my blog post, I suggest that the smaller states in these cases have used normative sea power by harnessing diplomatic, legal, soft power and communication strategies uh, to uh, create a normative argument uh, in combination to pressure bigger powers into litigation, which has then had the result in changing longstanding foreign policy. Uh, so Timor-Leste and Mauritius used different types of international legal and maritime dispute resolution mechanisms and different strategies to pressure Australia and the United Kingdom respectively. So public diplomacy has been very important. This often seeks to address the citizenry of target states. Uh, so publics, but also politicians uh, in Australia and the United Kingdom, as well as uh, a, a more international campaign that's designed to engage with uh, the international community. So these states can bounce off the legitimacy uh, that is provided by legal rulings or advisory opinions to make an, an, a normative argument about the rightness uh, of their claims. So in this way, the legal statecraft can be viewed as one element of a broader or more holistic strategy that small states can use to defend their maritime interests through the use of praise 
and or shame discourses, communication campaigns may call into question the legitimacy, the legality, the justice and the morality of the actions or positions of bigger states. They certainly lean into the asymmetrical power dynamic as well, that idea of the David versus Goliath uh, battles uh, that they are undergoing. So by winning the hearts and minds of people within target states and within the broader international community, um, they may then exert bottom-up pressure on governments. Uh, citizens may exert bottom-up pressure on governments uh, to, to support, to force a change in policies. So in both of these examples, the public diplomacy campaigns of Timor-Leste and Mauritius sought to call into, the que uh, call into question the extent to which Australia and the United uh, Kingdom follow the so-called international rules-based order. Both states uh, talk a lot about uh, the rules-based order in their strategic narratives, which is something that smaller states can leverage uh, in trying to, to, to create these sort of normative arguments uh, and normative th through their normative seed power strategies. So these approaches rely on the ongoing integrity and legitimacy of UNCLOS uh, in, in maritime disputes and the receptiveness of bigger powers to these rhetorical and legal legitimation strategies. They work on countries like Australia and the United Kingdom precisely because these countries take those, uh, the, those uh, legitimacy questions seriously, perhaps less effective on uh, even bigger powers uh, that may not uh, see uh, the legitimation question as being important to their broader strategic interests. But these examples show how instruments of statecraft, diplomacy, litigation, domestic and international activist campaigns used in combination can provide small states with a form of normative sea power in accessing legal maritime rights and entitlements and can hopefully expand our definition or our concept of what sea power entails. And I'll leave it there. Thanks, Doug. Thanks so much, and um, thanks to all of the panellists for keeping so well to time. We have uh, time now for our commentators and then potentially some Q&A. I note a couple of questions have already been dropped into the Q&A function on Zoom, and I hope we'll see more shortly. Uh, but, Martins, may I throw to you for your comments, questions or reflections? Thank you very much, uh, Douglas, and uh, well, thank you very much for having me as the commentator. It is uh, a delight uh, to see my former colleague again, albeit only on screen, and uh, to see on screen many scholars whose work I have read and greatly enjoyed and appreciated. Uh, we had a bit of a bilateral informal dispute settlement with uh, Nilofer that I will focus on some general issues uh, and Juliet's intervention. And Nilofer will focus more on the others, but of course it doesn't uh, suggest in any way disparagement of the wonderful interventions that Francis and Beck made. And of course I also read their uh, papers with great interest. I have four broader points about the project. Uh, and I think uh, I would invite all the uh, watchers uh, to go to the uh, CIL Dialogues website where all these arguments are unpacked in even greater detail. But the four things that struck me about the small states and legal straightcraft perspective, perhaps the first is the subject, uh, small states. And uh, Douglas and other colleagues are very sophisticated in unpacking the relativity of the concept. But I think it is worth perhaps being explicit about it. What is a small state? There's a certain, as it were, institutional capture. There is a forum uh, of small uh, states. But I think within the setting of this argument, it is essentially a relative concept, uh, and it uh, looks at the relative power within the particular dispute. And I think it's worth noting that there are states that will be small in relation to certain disputes and not small in relation uh, to other disputes. So Australia uh, in the nuclear tests case and Australia in the East Timor case, 
might be small in one setting or the other. Uh, and it could be that there are cases where states might be small, but in their interaction with international institutions or organizations, they are effectively acting as larger states. So we can think of Philippines and China, and we can think of Philippines and the International Criminal Court. And that, I think, is an interesting element, particularly when disputes in many settings are likely to be overlapping and partially um, contingent which makes it interesting to think about the relativity and opposability of smallness. Uh, the second point, and that is something that actually that uh, probably both Juliet and Beck made most explicitly is a domestic perspective, because we have looked here mostly at the international. And I think so one thing that strikes me perhaps a bit anecdotally that in the context of small states, a great deal of international legal argument is domestic. Uh, and it is reflective of sometimes sophisticated, sometimes less so domestic debates, the overlap between which influences the shaping that might not necessarily always be the one that is most felicitous uh, for being successful in international law terms. And I wonder whether that is also a perspective that is worth making much more, uh, that there are arguments that might not, that might fall a bit flat in the Great Hall, but that have a great significance for particular domestic actors without the support of which perhaps uh, the case uh, would not be brought. So that was my second point. The third point relates to the political and legal argument and the ability to fight for the language for framing the particular dispute. And I think that that is something that several scholars have looked at and uh, I think I was, I think Von Lowe is somebody who has written somewhat about it. I think it's of the sense that, that there may be a singular dispute, but the ability to frame it is on its own the real question. And I think his older example comes from the Security Council debates regarding the invasion of uh, Kuwait by Iraq. But I think it is arguable that if we look at some more recent Security Council uh, debates or the discussions regarding so the termination of Palestine, we will have similar uh, debates and the interesting question is whether there's a certain meta rule in international law that suggests that there might be a more appropriate settlement of disputes in a more political or legal context or whether that is all as it were completely opportunistic and dependent on what one actor is opting in uh, my fourth and final general point is i guess possibly a bit of a challenge. And the question is whether these are considerations that are peculiar to small states, or whether that is something that would apply to a significant extent to all states. So I think the arguments about trying to play to one's strength, uh, to trying to find the substantive rule and the institutional setting, whether one's position would be strongest, and would be likely to gather most legal and political support is something that I don't think that any P5 state legal advisor would have any queries with as regards their strategy. So that I think is something that struck me as interesting about the additional layer of where small state angle comes in. Uh, one thing that struck me as interesting here is that perhaps, you know, the, the layers in which communitarian and bilateral interests interplay, because of course, being able to come to a communitarian setting, to Security Council or to the International Court of Justice, emphasizes the communitarian element. And I think that that is something that Francis uh, framed very nicely uh, regarding the legal and political settings. But also, of course, it is the bilateralism that is a very attractive point here as well. In a contentious case, it is the claimant that frames the issues, even in an advisory proceeding. And I think we would all have, I think, heard over the great grapevine, the questions of the framing of the advisory opinion questions, but still they would be driven by particular actors. So there is that sense uh, of taking the best from the communitarian and bilateral. Uh, in short, uh, this strikes me as an extremely uh, fruitful perspective, and I thank Doug and team for bringing it up. Let me just say a few things about uh, Juliet's paper, which I greatly enjoyed as all of her scholarship, and uh, then I will uh, pass on to Nilofer. I I think that Juliet must be right that the mere ability to appear as routine as it might seem in many settings is so important. So we can think of so many 
symbolic moments. Uh, the Emperor of Ethiopia not permitted uh, to speak at the League of Nations Council because of Italian annexation. East Timor appearing in the title of the case and as a purported beneficiary, but not as a party. So that is something that to where with, with the docket bulging we might take as a given, but that is an extraordinarily important motive of proposition. Now, of course, and Juliet is also very right to caveat in the end that they are also, it doesn't mean that if one, if a small state goes to the court, it wins. If anything, we assume the opposite. We assume that a sophisticated large state, particularly a P5 state, has unparalleled institutional memory of how United Nations and international law works. And it may be that that is something that is projected also in the judicial setting. And I think it's not necessarily all cases where small states have gone to the court in the last years have been unadorned successes. And I think uh, Cameron Miles's article on provisional measures in the first Ukraine-Russia case in the British yearbook is something that tackles that somewhat. But still, I think also Juliet is, must be right in her broader point that having said all that, there does seem to be, not at the legal level necessarily, but perhaps at the level of policymakers and politicians of large states, a certain sense of psychological discomfort of being put on a symbolically equal level. And that, that we are going back to the sense of all international law being domestic. It does seem to me that by and large, large by switching the forum, uh, lawyers are forced to make suboptimal legal arguments in a setting that uh, the policy makers in the background are not necessarily that uh, easily or comfortable with. So that I think is perhaps the, where the, the practical sense why small states actually do succeed quite a lot. And the last point, which I think is something that builds partly on Juliet's and partly on the broader point, perhaps the point that going to a court compared with a lengthier process, while it has its costs, in a bigger scheme of things, they are comparatively small if we compare that with contributing to a rule of customary law for a century or to consistent state practice and so on. Because in many ways, international lawmaking rewards people who have money to pay large legal departments and to enable that consistency is one proxy that we consider for the weight. So in that sense, even setting aside $10 million for a particular legal case, while large on its own terms, might be a cheaper alternative than having been fortunate enough to be a part of an independent polity for the last century and being able to have a consistent legal advice. So there are layers and complexities which our speakers have so wonderfully dealt with. Thanks again for letting me be part of it. Back to you, Doug. Uh Thank you for those very generous reflections, uh, Martins. Um, Nulifer. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Um, and I hope my connection is okay. Uh, first of all, greetings to all those who are joining us. And I see we have a, uh, a very good uh, group of participants. Delighted to see that. And I really want to thank um, uh, Professor Douglas Guilfoyle for leading the symposia uh, for CIL Dialogues on an issue that is really um, fascinating and important. And I think today with our wonderful contributors and panelists, you've really brought out uh, the highlights um, uh, of the symposia, but as well as the, the issue of small states, uh, international litigation, um, and questions of asymmetry, uh, leveling the play field, um, strategic, um, uh, when we talk about state, uh, legal statecraft. Um, so I'm just going to make some short comments um, and following the you know, very uh, uh, illuminating reflections that my dear colleague uh, Martins made. And what I'm going to do is just look at, say, a few words on the law of the sea issues, which uh, starting with, of course, 
Professor Guilfoyle and um, the focus on um, international litigation under the law of the Sea Convention and of course, small states. And so I would like to just reflect on the law of the Sea Convention itself. And it is a remarkable convention for many reasons, but one also, and I think is that actually small states, developing states had a very influential role in making of the convention. And going back to the point that Martin's, when we, we know what is the concept of small, what do we mean by it? And I do agree with that because it's not necessarily size per se, but the question of asymmetry of power of influence. Um, but here we're talking in the era of the um, uh, post-colonial, coming out of colonialism, the, the large states, which the 1958 um, uh, Geneva Convention, of course, was very much a product of the ILC, so we won't necessarily comment on that per se, but the Law of the Sea Convention, which was initiated by a small state, Malta, um, the precedents of the Law of the Sea Convention small states, including our very own Tommy Co in Singapore. There are many influential um, uh, leaders such as Fiji, Satyananda, small state. Um, and a lot of the issues were driven by small states, not necessarily, again, what we mean, but when I think about issues such as the development of archipelagic uh, waters, uh, that notion, small state. So I can go on. So I think that looking at, at the, from the perspective of the small state um, is, is very important. And, and we can see how it's developed because again, one of the um, important characteristics of the Law of the Sea Commission was the compulsory dispute settlement part. And again, you have the big states and the small states agreeing on this which um, because the big states, the large states, except, well, there's one that is not a party, but otherwise um, have agreed to the notion of compulsory dispute settlement. So right there, um, the leveling of the playing field, uh, which is how we would like to see law actually, um, particularly when we're talking about courts, whether it be domestic or international, and that is important where the notion of equality does play out. And, you've, and so there've been a number of cases. So uh, instead of focusing on the cases um, that um, Douglas has looked at, um, I do want to, for some self-serving reasons, go to the, some of the points Francis was making on a sea level rise, because I find it absolutely fascinating um, how this group of small states large ocean states, but territorially small states, but to be quite honest as well, I mean, politically uh, until perhaps um, climate change, not necessarily powerful states, uh, politically speaking. And those are um, the Pacific Island states um, who have played, um, I, I refer to them as really being at the forefront and vanguard of moving the needle of climate change. But when we're looking at law of the sea, uh, issues related to law of the sea, sea level rise. And of course, we also have the questions of um, uh, statehood uh, as well. And so I just wanted to give a little anecdotal background, how that works. And I think what we're looking at is the package. Um, so how is it that the ILC took up the topic of sea level rise? Um, it wasn't by chance. It was again the small uh, or the small island states, small island developing states, particularly Pacific Islands Forum, were very, very proactive for, for a long time. And when the opportunities arise in UN Forum, they would actually make the request for the ILC to take up the case. There is a campaigning process, which I think is a topic all in of itself, but they were very, very vocal to all the campaign, all the uh, candidates for the ILC to take up the issue. Importantly, in 2018, um, we received a request from one of the, from Micronesia, Federated States of Micronesia, a formal request 
for the ILC to take up this issue. This was the first, first time we ever received, or the uh, commission, I should say, received such a formal request from a state, even though it is permitted under the statute. Um, so it was this galvanization and now it is in, uh, the International Law Commission has taken it up. I, will, I don't want to go on too long because I know we have limited time. Um, and it is fascinating because we're witnessing, uh, and you, you summarize it very nicely, Francis, we are really witnessing the evolution of international law on, on, the, uh, on the question of um, preservation of baselines and maritime entitlements. And it continues more how small states Vanuatu um, took lead and charge to bring the questions of climate change in front of the ICJ. So I'm going a little outside of the law of the sea, but they've also included the law of the sea convention in that. And that really in and of itself is a remarkable trajectory of how a small state, and, and, and we know it started with students as well, so even smaller perhaps, in terms of power, has really been able to galvanize this um, issue and brought it now to the forefront of the international community. So I will conclude by saying this, it's not simply about winning or losing at all. How we use international law, including the court system, including forums such as the International Law Commission, General Assembly, to make change, and small states are doing that. And I, I wish I could talk more about the Mauritius uh, Chagos case. I think it's one of the most fascinating and important cases, but I won't <laughs> I'll stop here and just thank everyone again for this excellent symposia. And I know we could talk more, but let's hope we get some good questions. So I will stop here. Terrific, thank you both for those. Um... Uh, comments and reflections. I think I will ask the moderators to give us a uh, five minute extension of time. Um, those working very diligently in the background to make sure we all remain online. And I will ask each panelist uh, to provide any reflections they might have in no more than two minutes. Um, there are also a couple of questions on uh, the Q&A chat, and I see that uh, Juliet, I think, has answered one of those in text already. Uh, but the other two were, can we provide any commentary on the relationship between legal argument and small islands in the context of climate change? Obviously, France's paper went to that, but it, particularly the question of advisory proceedings. So if anyone has any thoughts on that. And the other um, question in the Q&A was, are there any cases where the characterization of a dispute by bigger states as non-legal was advantageous or disadvantageous to smaller states in judicial proceedings? I'm going to abuse my prerogative as chair and to take that last question before throwing to everyone else. Um, and I am, I cannot find a case, certainly not a recent one, where a greater power asserting that the dispute was fundamentally non-legal or non-justiciable uh, had any ultimate impact on proceedings. Courts are very reluctant to find uh, the existence of Martin's uh, meta rule that some um, disputes are more aptly resolved in uh, a political rather than a legal forum. The approach of courts is typically, if there's a legal question, we will answer it and presume that that makes a constructive contribution to resolving the broader dispute. What I would say is that great states make that argument so consistently, and we can see it in uh, the US letter uh, withdrawing from proceedings in Nicaragua, that and, and make it so consistently knowing that courts will generally uh, or invariably um, decline to put any weight on it, that the court, in my view, cannot be the audience for that argument, right? Again, this goes to the point uh, to which uh, legal proceedings can be part of the theatre or part of the court of international public opinion more broadly. So those arguments are not being put to sway the court, they're being put as part of uh, the theatre of proceedings to try and delegitimize the attack coming from the smaller state. Um, there are many things I could say uh, otherwise, but um, it would be very dull 
uh, you might use when there are so many others available. So in the order that we heard from the speakers, um, Juliet, uh, any comments you'd like to make in absolutely no more than two minutes, please. I'll take even less than two minutes because I basically agree with everything you just said. Um, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I think it's very much a case of, of uh, positioning for debates that are happening external to the court. The court is not really interested in these um, it's non-legal kinds of arguments. If they can find a ground of jurisdiction, they will they will plow ahead. Um, consent, uh, actually, in jurisdiction seems to be the much bigger issue uh, for the courts. So that's my 30 second take. Uh, of course, you're welcome to weigh in on anything else that any of the commentators have said, but we can we can come back to you if you signal there is anything else you'd like to address. Um, Francis. Francis, you're on mute. Thank you, Doug. I'll be similarly brief. Um, there's much more that I could say, but all I would add, um, and picking up on the question that came in about the relationship between legal argument and small islands, I guess I would kind of um, draw on what Nilfa has mentioned in terms of the um, the multiplicity of legal fora in which we are actually seeing small island states um, individually or in coalition um, collectively um, leading these conversations on some of the most challenging issues of our generation. Um, I think that um, it, it shows a great confidence in, I think, the, the ability of the legal system to actually um, be open to being a forum to ventilate um, and to actually um, uh, be receptive to some of these very difficult issues before our time. So I guess perhaps I hope that I won't look back on this and think that was a very naive comment, but I do feel that there is um, some positivity in, I guess, the recourse to legal argument um, in these settings at a time of great challenge. So um, I think that it is actually something which small states uh, have often been on the forefront of, but actually the beneficiaries go much beyond um, those original proponents to many more states um, than just the small states. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Francis. Uh, Beck? Uh, yes, just very briefly on the issue of size and small states and smallness. I mean, I think Tom Long wrote an excellent um, journal article on relativity as being, you know, a crucial uh, element in understanding uh, size. And certainly in bilateral asymmetrical powers, we can talk about smaller and, and bigger powers, um, it, perhaps uh, more easily than we can in, in some of the more um, collective or multilateral settings. But um, the point that, that sort of raised around, you know, small states and, and middle power diplomacy, often the, the strategies, what states do is quite similar. The literature on small state diplomacy and middle power diplomacy has a lot of overlaps. And I would say that normative sea power applies to all states. Uh, it's not just small uh, states that, that employ it. Uh, and if anybody's interested, I have a recently um uh, a recently published piece in contemporary security policy that actually looks at the counter narratives that Australia and the UK employed in order to try to circumvent or get around the narratives that small that that, that the UK and Mauritius, um, sorry Mauritius and Timor Leste were employing. Uh, those counter narratives ultimately did not kind of allow the UK and Australia to continue on business as usual. Uh Beck, thank you very much for your brevity. Um, two further questions have come in in the chat, which I'll just attempt to address uh, very briefly. One is the question of, uh, can, can this type of litigation um, create negative consequences for other small states? So uh, bringing up the example of the Mauritius Maldives maritime delimitation case, which was certainly seen in some quarters as principally brought to pressure the UK of the Chagos archipelago. And it was Certainly the case that part of the Maldives argument was essentially, we don't want to be here. We're being forced to take a side. But once jurisdiction was found, proceedings seemed to go on quite happily and jovially. And the two states um, in question, as it were, uh, patched it up. Um, but, it, but it's obviously potentially a risk one should be alive too. And the other is, um, well, ICJ, it lost proceedings um, 
regarding advisory opinions on climate change address the question of maritime entitlements. Um, I suppose at this stage we don't know, but it would be surprising if the issue was not touched on. Uh, I guess the last thing I'd sort of say in con conclusion, which goes to a number of the points made, but particularly, uh, but not exclusively by Martins, is, is there anything particular and distinct about looking at small states in these sorts of issues? And I think there is for a couple of reasons. Um, some of them, uh, Martins himself actually pointed to, right? The, uh, the psychological discomfort of putting great powers who are not used to having to answer for their foreign policy on the spot. But more than that, I do think there are classes of state that are genuinely small in the sense that uh, they are more used to being consensus builders and having to navigate um, in the international system where we might assume that large legal departments or foreign offices in great powers would have an advantage. But the thing is, if you expect that to get anywhere, you have to build coalitions. You perhaps have a rather different view of these things than if you think actually the big coalition building fight is with your defense department and other wings of government before you can take a position to a collective forum. So I think there's something about the agility of small states and their ability to bring these proceedings when they decide it's a genuine national priority. Whereas even in Australia, I know there were um, debates about, you know, how, for example, the whaling case would be funded. I believe there had to be a sort of special budget appropriation line item. It wasn't the case that you could have a small, uh, the cabinet of a small estate getting all the stakeholders together quickly and saying, this is a national priority. We're simply going to do it. So I do think while you, while some of the, uh, while we're all correct that, you know, there's a relativity involved here and some of these things work uh, you know, a state might be large in one context and small in another. I do think there are some genuine sort of attributes of smallness and largeness in play. Uh, with that slightly sort of quixotic um, final comment, uh, I think um, we've imposed on everyone's time long enough. Thank you, uh, the very large number of uh, you online who've stayed with us all the time. And uh, I wish you a pleasant uh, rest of your day or evening or afternoon, as the case may be. Thank you so much. Thank you.